What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Alright, so continuing our discussions on all new, all different Marvel, what I wanted to do is I wanted to jump into the current run of Uncanny Avengers, because I wanted to get this out there, you know, without straying too far away from Civil War 2, because we're about a week removed from the Civil War 2 event, maybe a little bit less, and so it's still relatively fresh in people's minds. At the very least, most people have a reasonable idea of what went on. Really kind of like the big thing that happened in Civil War 2, to be honest, was really the death of Bruce Banner. Now, what Uncanny Avengers does is it follows up to this as a Civil War 2 tie-in. Now, when it comes to all new, all different Marvel, the Civil War II tie-ins were usually tie-ins by name only. And what I mean by that is historically speaking, when it comes to like tie-ins for major crossover events, they tie directly into it. For example, during Civil War I, all the Captain America publications leading up to really Captain America Volume 5 by Ed Brubaker, those were all tie-ins to the events of Civil War. But it wasn't like Steve Rogers was off doing his own thing in some other part of the world. It was literally showing what he was doing while the Civil War event was going on. When it comes to Civil War II, the, the name Civil War is just kind of slapped onto the tie-ins and a lot of them don't really have anything to do with what's going on but uncanny avengers actually does now what initially happens here is we kind of pick up with the funeral of bruce banner because remember this is still pretty fresh in the minds of everybody it's really only happened recently and we really have a lot of people here who have played significant roles in the life of bruce banner in some form or fashion and of course we have ben Grimm, who's fought the incredible hulk on a multitude of occasions fought alongside the incredible hulk we have deadpool you know who's fought the hulk we have a uh, silver surfer who is part of the defenders alongside the incredible hulk as well as Doctor Strange. It's really kind of like people that knew Bruce Banner in some form or fashion over the course of his life. But somebody else that I also want to draw your attention to is a guy by the name of Daniel Drum who appears to Brother Voodoo. Now, Daniel Drum is really like the twin brother of Jericho, of Brother Voodoo. Now, Brother Voodoo is a guy that really dates back quite some time. He was created for the purpose of, of offering some kind of alternative to Doctor Stephen Strange just because of the fact that back in the day, Doctor Strange's comics weren't selling. And so Marvel was toying with the idea of getting Stephen out of there and replacing him with somebody else. The issue was that Brother Voodoo didn't really do much better in terms of sales, and so he was a character that just kind of exists, and he just floats around in left field, and he appears every once in a while. Really, putting him on Uncanny Avengers is a way that makes sense. But something else I'd also want to draw your attention to is the formation of the Uncanny Avengers team. As most of you guys notice, you kind of see a mixed bag going on here, in the sense you've got Captain America, you've got Deadpool, and we kind of talked about this, you know, when All New, All Different Marvel first launched, but for those of you guys who are new here to Comics Explained, All New, All Different Uncanny Avengers really comes out of the roster before Secret Wars, and what's called the Unity Squad. And what had happened is after the events of Avengers vs. X-Men, which created a rift between the Avengers and the X-Men over the return of the Phoenix Force, once it was all said and done, Steve Rogers sat down and said, okay, we need a Unity Squad. We need a team, basically, that will be composed of mutants and superpowered beings that are not mutants. And so we just kind of got a mishmash of everything. Now, once uh, all new, all different Marvel kicked in, and once the main ongoing story was, well, there's some, you know, huge conflict that went on between the Inhumans and the X-Men. We don't know what it was, and we didn't find out until Death of X came out, we saw a character's synapse of the Inhumans being thrown onto the team. And that was really just a way to, to again, you know, keep this Unity Squad theme going by kind of having a mixed bag. So we have current X-Men, we have an Inhuman on the team, and we have people who have superpowers, but are neither mutants nor Inhumans. So from here, we pick up with Cable. Now, this is the other half of the equation in the sense that because of the fact that this is a tie-in, it deals with the idea that Ulysses, who was, of course, again, this Inhuman that could see the future or believed he could see the future, he basically got to Captain America and said, hey, look, there's going to be a major conflict and it's going to be started by Cable. You have to find some way to reel him in. Your Unity Squad is effectively not trustworthy. They're working, you know, for their own goals and their own motivations in some form or fashion. Now, ultimately, this leads to Steve Rogers basically throwing a tracking device onto the body of Deadpool and following him when he eventually met up with Cable and Toad and Sebastian Shaw. Now, with regards to meeting with Sebastian Shaw and with Toad, the reason why this happened is because of the fact that the Cable had sat down and had basically been given information from Sebastian Shaw and Toad that basically indicated that the U.S. government was experimenting with the Terrigen myths. Now, what this does, I mean, Jerry Dugan is a really good writer, but what this does is cause continuity issues for Cable. And that's really the biggest problem with this character, is Cable is a guy where every time something happens in comics, it's basically, this event happened in his timeline. It's one of those really weird situations. And so, you know, like when he first showed up, for example, in like 1989, I think it was, everything from the time that he first appeared in Marvel Comics, you know, up until 1989, that had all happened in his timeline, you know, when he came from the 
future. And as time progressed, more things got added in. And it was a way for Marvel to basically have his character come back and change things. So as the 1980s turned into the 1990s, turned into the 2000s, into the 2010s, suddenly it was between the time that Cable was born and was sent to the future and the time that he first came back from the future, then events like Messiah Complex and events like House of M and Avengers Disassembled and Thor Ragnarok and Decimation, you know, and Avengers vs. X-Men and Axis and Civil War, all those things had all happened during his timeline. Well, the reason why it creates continuity issues is because if all this stuff happened during his timeline, then why is it that he doesn't know about these things? For example, if the US government planned to experiment with the Terrigen Mist, then how does Cable not know the end results of that? Now, the reason why I say this is, again, a continuity issue is because during the first Civil War event, the Cable and Deadpool tie-ins literally saw Cable going to the President of the United States and saying, you cannot implement the Superhuman Registration Act. I know how it's going to end up. I'm from the future and I know what's going to happen. So on one hand, Cable's knowledge of the future helps him fix problems. On the other hand, he somehow doesn't know about these things taking place. And so again, that's one of the reasons why Cable is a mixed bag. And so for a lot of you guys who look at his character and say, well, why doesn't Cable just solve everything? It's because a lot of writers just don't really know how to handle him because having him in any kind of a major crossover event, he's almost like the guy that knows how to solve the problem because he's like, well, hey, here's how things turn out. So all we have to do is just do this. And then the problem's solved. So again, it kind of creates a, a weird situation. But the other half of this is again, Sebastian Shaw. For the most part, Steve Rogers is not necessarily against mutants, but Steve Rogers is taking the stance that, hey, we can't implicitly trust the government, but we also have to recognize that mutants can't just barge into a government facility, steal information about the Terrigen Mist and what the government's working on, and then believe everything is going to be okay. We essentially have to work with the government to find out what's going on. Now, keep in mind, this is all the front side of Steve Rogers. And Nick Spencer's Captain America Steve Rogers, you know, he's working against everybody. I mean, for him, what this is doing is leading to the scenario that he wants, where the teams are being disbanded, where the heroes just don't really trust each other. I mean, it's really everything that he's going for. And so the way that I like to look at Steve Rogers and anything outside of Nick Spencer's Captain America story is that what we're seeing is like the face he's putting on to the world. The real Steve Rogers is what you find in Nick Spencer's Captain America Steve Rogers story. And if you're not reading that, like I've been saying, it's an amazing story. You really, really, really need to check that out. But you know, Sebastian Shaw steps up and says, hey, look, man, we don't have time to wait for humanity to get us back together and trust mutants. Either you can move out of the way or I can move you out of the way. Now, in truth, Sebastian Shaw could do it. I mean, Captain America is a pretty formidable fighter, but keep in mind, Sebastian Shaw's ability is to absorb energy, any form of energy, whether it's kinetic energy through punches, whether it's like, you know, psionic energy, energy blast, it doesn't matter what it is. If it can impact his body and put off any kind of shock wave or do any kind of damage, his body will absorb it and turn it into physical strength. And so it's really one of these things where the more Captain America fights Sebastian Shaw, the stronger Sebastian Shaw will get. And really, you know, he would absolutely pummel him. The kicker about all this is that Cable, of course, eventually steps into the fray. Now, the cool thing about a lot of this stuff is we get some really interesting dialogue from Rogue. And Rogue's really just kind of watching all these events unfold. And she's like, how did we get to this point? Now, again, this is Jerry Duggan tying directly into the events before Secret Wars. Avengers versus X-Men, the death of Charles Xavier, Cyclops effectively being killed during the death of X storyline. You know, it's her sitting down and saying, at what point did this happen? At what point did we go from being a team that seemed to be able to function, that had its gear in order? At what point did the superhero community become fractured? Was someone like Wolverine really that significant of a linchpin that when he died after being cased in adamantium, everything just all went to pot? Now, in truth, it was just a lot of different things that led to the current situation. But the fact remains that Rogue steps in, of course, with her super strength and says, you guys stop fighting. Deadpool, take this case, get out of here, do whatever they need to do. Of course, the case is handed off to uh, Toad and to Sebastian Shaw. Get out of here, go do whatever it is you need to do. The rest of us will stay behind. Now, at this point, Steve Rogers steps up and says, you're all fired. Every last one of you are fired. The, uh, you know, Avengers Unity Squad is completely disbanded. Now, again, like I said, this is part of Steve Rogers' plan because what he gets to do is he gets to get rid of one of the most formidable teams in Marvel Comics right now. Because remember, with the Avengers Unity Squad, you've got Deadpool, who's effectively immortal. You've got Rogue, who could take the powers of anyone she touches. You've got Cable, who is a retcon machine. That's his power, is to fix things. No, he's a, he's a guy that has near Omega level telekinesis and telepathy. Really, it's his techno-organic virus that keeps him from achieving that level of power. But his technology is almost second to none. I mean, you've got Quicksilver, who's extremely fast. Synapse of the Inhumans, who can control people's nervous systems. I mean, this is a very, very powerful team. For Steve Rogers to turn around and to basically disband it, basically kind of brings him up to the top and then brings him crashing back down again. And so really, it just kind of leaves everybody in a weird situation, you know, where you have Rogue and you have Deadpool who are kind of like, you know, what are we going to do now? I guess that's that. But then picking up with Brother Voodoo, we effectively have Daniel Drum, who's been resurrected from the dead. Now, this was done explicitly by the hand. And in fact, he says 
that. He says, the hand has brought me back to life. They did it within an hour and I gave them instructions on how to find Bruce Banner's body. Now, the reason why this matters is because this is not the first time the hand has done this. And in fact, as we pick up with Rogue and Deadpool, basically transitioning, grabbing the rest of the Avengers team without telling them they've all been fired by Steve Rogers and taking off to Tokyo, Japan, the hand has brought back heroes, brought back characters from the dead before. One of the most notable was Wolverine. He wasn't really resurrected from the dead per se, so much as he was taken by the hand and Hydra, brainwashed, and then turned into an assassin. And so whenever a situation would emerge where he was on the verge of being captured, he would basically be able to escape using a combination of technology and mysticism. Now, the most prominent person to have died and been resurrected by the hand is, of course, Elektra. And that's why she's called here, really, by Deadpool, because of the fact that she's the best point of contact for the hand because she led them at one point in time. And so it's actually really cool to kind of see her on board. But of course, you know, she says, hey, look, the hand are ants across Tokyo. There's no central hub. The whole country of Japan is literally their farm. It's their ant farm. If you destroy this place, well, then they'll all just go to another place and they'll build a new bunker somewhere and that kind of thing. So she says, what you have to do is draw them out. Now, the funny thing about this, this is why I love Deadpool on Uncanny Avengers. The funny thing about this, you know, is Johnny Storm's like, hey, we're not going to blow up a building. All right, we're not terrorists. And while he says that, Deadpool's like, fire in the hole. And he blows that building up without a second thought. And it's hilarious because after that, you know, we have the hand coming out in full force. Now, the other half of this is that the hand are extremely capable fighters, guys. I mean, we're talking about people who are trained from childhood, who are trained from birth to be the absolute best when it comes to hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's one of the reasons why the hand is so dangerous, but it's also mysticism. Now, again, because of the fact that Synapse and because of the fact that Brother Voodoo were here, Synapse can mess with their nervous system, but Brother Voodoo can invoke magic. And now being able to invoke magic basically allows him to create what's referred to as this kind of karmic bomb. All it really means is that all the pain and suffering that the hand or these various people have imposed on others is basically revisited back on them to the point that they're pushed to the brink of complete and total insanity. Now, of course, using this extreme pain to their advantage, the Avengers are like, where are they keeping Bruce Banner? So, of course, they're given the location and they effectively head out to where it is that Bruce Banner's being uh, resurrected more or less. Now, when they get there, we see that the normal ritual that the hand uses, but of course, this is designed to be a ruse. So the reason why is because the hand are no fools. They are extremely intelligent. The hand do have their soldiers. The hand do have their mystics, but the most formidable weapon of the hand are the people who are just in the shadows reporting everything they see. The little birds, for those of you guys who watch Game of Thrones, that's really the most formidable advantage that the hand have is they have spies everywhere. It doesn't mean they have spies in the Avengers. It simply means that there are people who the Avengers may not have been caring about or who may not have been paying any attention to who were just watching all this unfold and then just reported back to the hand, hey, they're coming, like they're coming for Bruce Banner. Now, when they get there, the indication as it's being put on by their mystics is that, oh my God, we have to stop them from trying to stop us from resurrecting Banner. And while the Avengers are successful in stopping the ritual, we learn that the person there is not actually Banner. Instead, he was being resurrected in the catacombs below. And so because of all this, Banner basically emerges as the Incredible Hulk. Now, whenever it comes to people who are resurrected by the hand, think of them as like mindless monsters. That's really the best way to consider them. And the reason for this is because of the fact that when they first come back, they don't have themselves. For those of you guys who are coming from DC Comics, it's like when a person is brought back through the Lazarus pits. It's really a circumstance where, you know, you have to give them an instruction. You have to tell them what to do. Otherwise, they just revert to their most bestial form or their most primitive form. Now, for some people, reverting to the most primitive form is simply just sitting in a room and doing nothing. For the Incredible Hulk, it's let's just destroy stuff. And so because of this, the Hulk basically just begins rampaging and running through Japan and actually steps on Deadpool, which is actually kind of funny. But from here, we jump back to Cable. And again, what we find out here is that the Cable's technology only goes so far, or at least his understanding of what all this information means only goes so far. Because remember, he can use technology like weapons and shields and stuff like that, but he's not a scientist. The best scientist to really go to is Hank McCoy. The issue with this is that Hank McCoy is part of the Inhumans. And so if Cable were to go to Hank McCoy and say, hey, look, we want to find a way to destroy the Terrigen Mist. Will you help us using this information? Uh, Hank McCoy will basically say no. But the information, when it's sent to him covertly, without him knowing who it's coming from, when it's sent anonymously, he can work with whoever this person is, whoever Cable claims to be. From there, the two of them can work together to find a way to preserve mutant kind in response to the Terrigen Mist. The issue with this is that they haven't really been able to find a way at the moment because, again, the information is just not there. They don't have what they need to fully pull this off. In response to this, something that I want to point out here is Captain America. When it comes to someone like Cable, it's very easy to look at him as a guy who's very removed from the Marvel Universe because in a lot of ways he is. I mean, he's literally a man who's just traveling through time because keep in mind, no matter what story you see Cable in, the story is essentially a middle ground. It's part of a journey. And the reason why I say that is in... Daniel Way, I think maybe, I don't remember who it was that wrote it, wrote Cable and Deadpool Volume 1. One of the stories towards the end, when it got into the 20s, I think the issue number 
20s, it dealt with the realization that Cable had basically gone back in time when he was younger and he had fought against Apocalypse. Now, this was basically Cable came to the realization that he was basically creating his own prophecy, but that's always the goal. Cable is always trying to find a way to annihilate, to destroy Apocalypse. And so when you see him in a story, he's just on his way to doing that. So it's like he's going on a road trip, driving from one side of the country to the next, and along the way, he stops for Civil War, and he stops for whatever this story happens to be, and he stops for whatever that story happens to be, and Avengers versus X-Men, and so on and so forth. It's just pit stops along the way to his goal of annihilating Apocalypse. And so that's why it kind of creates an interesting dynamic. But notice the way he talks about Captain America. This is why Steve Rogers is such an important character, even if a lot of people don't know he's a Hydra agent. And in fact, if no one except for, you know, Red Skull, and Baron Zemo and Eric Selvig know that he's a Hydra agent, it's the fact that they look at him with such reverence. From the future, from, you know, thousands, you know, 3,000 years in the future, whatever it is, Cable looks back on the legacy of Captain America and says, he's Captain America, man. His legacy will live on for thousands and thousands of years because of the things that he did, leading the Avengers into some of the greatest battles ever, facing the fact that he may die, but standing on his feet and going against Thanos, knowing it was impossible for Captain America to defeat Thanos while he had the Infinity Gauntlet. That's the reason why people look at Captain Captain America is one of the most prominent heroes in Marvel Comics, even within Marvel's own continuity. Now, of course, in the midst of this discussion with Sebastian Shaw, where he basically says, hey, look, there's nothing we can do with the Terrigen Mist right now with the information we have. We need more info later on. He's basically alerted to the fact that the Avengers are going against, you know, some force in Japan. Now, of course, when he gets there, at least as he makes his travels, he tells Sebastian Shaw and Toad, hey, come along and help us out. Because if people see mutants fighting on behalf of humanity, then maybe people will start to turn their head in support of mutants. Maybe they'll be more willing to help mutants than they were before. The problem with this is that as soon as Sebastian Shaw and Toad stick their head to the portal and they see a 10, 11 foot tall Incredible Hulk rampaging through Japan, they're just like, nope, not having any of that, and they peace out. And so that's pretty much the end of them as far as this conflict is concerned. But again, the cool thing about this is that this really just shows us how powerful a mindless Hulk is. And it's not the first time that we've seen something like this. When it comes to the Incredible Hulk, and this this is something that I don't really know if we've talked about this per se, or at least talked about it explicitly, but there's a big difference between the Incredible Hulk, you know, when Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk, and the Incredible Hulk, when Bruce Banner is separated from the Hulk. When Bruce Banner transforms into the Hulk, he has some measure of influence over what it is the Hulk does. It's, you know, sometimes it's minimal, sometimes it's massive, depending on who's writing the story and what version of the Hulk that we're talking about. But if we're talking about, you know, your average run-of-the-mill story where the Incredible Hulk's just tearing stuff up, Bruce Banner has a subconscious effect on the Hulk so that he doesn't go to the extreme. Now, World War Hulk was really like Hulk going to the extreme. Now, that was a powerful version of the Hulk. He was wildly powerful. Part of the monster Hulk is stupid powerful. Like, it's insane how strong that version of the Hulk is, which I'm really excited to cover that story. Heart of the Monster is so good. But the fact remains here that having an Incredible Hulk where Bruce Banner has no influence on what the Hulk does, the most interesting example I can think of that was during the Onslaught saga when Jean Grey realized that the only way to really defeat Onslaught was to just let the Incredible Hulk's unbridled strength run amok. And so she effectively ripped the uh, Bruce Banner persona out of the Incredible Hulk and it was just Savage Hulk just tearing shit up. And it was really, really cool because it was like he was the only person who could go against Onslaught and damage his physical body. That's kind of what we're getting here. I mean, we're not getting like World War Hulk level strength, but it's the idea that they can't reason with the Incredible Hulk, they can't talk him down, they can't get him to pay attention, they just cannot stop him through any conventional means. So what happens is we have a Quicksilver basically take Brother Voodoo to Hashima Island, and this is basically just an abandoned old coal island. And what Brother Voodoo is doing is effectively setting a soul trap, because what this will do is it'll basically ensnare the soul of whoever's trapped within, and then allow Brother Voodoo to communicate with them on the astral plane. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second, but because of the fact that Banner really can't be stopped here, the battle really moves itself towards the direction of a nuclear power plant, which really, you know, makes the issues, you know, even more extreme because of the fact that if Hulk were to go crazy and turn this into Tokyo's version of Chernobyl, it would wipe out Tokyo. It would make it uninhabitable for 500 some odd years. And so it would create a, a terrible situation, not to mention, you know, any of the radiation that's kind of pushed around through toxic fog, or if we were to have the radiation merging with like the Terrigen mist, and then you know, really just kind of setting nuclear winter for, you know, how however many hundreds of years, but the Avengers do what they can to really hold them off. But at this point, they're just kind of like a stopgap measure. I mean, Elektra basically says the only way to really get rid of the hand's influence on a person who's been touched is to effectively incinerate their body. Well, the Incredible Hulk is immune to fire. So what do you do? I mean, if you can't incinerate his body, you know, what do you do? Well, you do exactly what the Avengers are doing here. And you basically just lead him to Hashima Island to where Brother Voodoo is. Now, as soon as he gets there, you know, of course, Synapse basically tries to manipulate his central nervous system and she's able to do it just 
just enough that he basically trips into the soul trap that Brother Voodoo has set. And what this does is it allows Brother Voodoo to again begin speaking with Bruce Banner on the astral plane. And now in Marvel Comics, the astral plane is like this interesting situation. For those of you guys who are always curious, how does like telepathy work in Marvel Comics? The astral plane is how it works. All thought, all dreams, all nightmares, all ideas, they can all be accessible through the astral plane. So think about it this way. Think of the astral plane as, you know, kind of like this psychic equivalent to the X-Men movies when Charles Xavier put on Cerebro and was able to see all the mutants across the world and all the humans. Imagine that a person was in this kind of weird euphoric area and they could basically access all the thoughts and all the feelings, but anybody who could access the astral plane could go there as well. So it's kind of like this ethereal meeting ground for anybody with psychic powers. The issue with this is that the astral plane is usually being held or is, is occupied by the Shadow King and he really makes things bad for anybody who, who shows up there. Um, but again, as far as I know, the Shadow King's not present as part of all new, all different Marvel. But with Brother Voodoo talking to the spirit of Bruce Banner, of course, he's met with the emergence of the hands demon entity that's effectively taken over Bruce Banner. This is really just kind of like the physical manifestation of the sorcery that was used by the hand, the mysticism that was used by the hand to bring Bruce Banner back. And it tries to reason with Brother Voodoo because Voodoo's a legitimate threat here. Voodoo could actually, you know, reverse the magic that's been done and basically free the soul of Bruce Banner because that's what happens. When the hand brings somebody back, when a person dies in Marvel Comics, they kind of go to the realm of Mistress Death. They actually, you know, leave the physical realm and traverse into the realm of death. What the hand do is they basically search throughout that realm and they grab the spirit of the individual who's there and they bring them back only in just enough to basically power their body. And so because of this, this isn't like Bruce Banner in the traditional sense. Like Bruce Banner doesn't really talk. He doesn't have a conversation. He doesn't really say anything. It's just that his spirit is effectively freed by this demon entity. When Brother Voodoo says, look, you know, I'm going to free Bruce Banner and he effectively banishes this demon. In response to that, Bruce Banner's soul is effectively able to leave and, you know, and go back to heaven and to be at peace. And so it's really, you know, Bruce Banner staying dead. Now, in truth, that seems to be what Jerry Duggan was doing here. He was basically writing a story saying, hey guys, this is Bruce Banner dead. He's gone. He's not coming back. Now, of course, we know this will last just long enough for whatever next Avengers or Hulk movie is going to be coming out. But it basically, again, allows uh, Duggan to set the stage for the next set of events, which of course we'll see the Avengers going against Red Skull and effectively cleaning up a lot of these plot threads that were left behind from like Axis when the Red Skull took the brain of Charles Xavier after his death during Avengers versus X-Men and uh, saw the Red Skull using the powers of Charles Xavier to his own means and his own ends. It's really just Dugan kind of wrapping all these things up. And that seems to be what's happening with regards to Uncanny Avengers is Dugan's really just kind of going through and taking all these plot threads that were left behind after Secret Wars ended and all new all different Marvel started and just closing them out, which works fine for me because I've always been wanting to see what happens when it comes to the Red Skull having the brain of Charles Xavier and how that'll come to an end. But yeah, if you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and uh, yeah, I will catch you all in the next video. Peace.